everyone's picture going to appear up on my screen here? Yes. Oh, that's a lot of people who are storming in to be a part of this uh, little meetup. Okay, it looks like. So, hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to let people in slowly. Uh, and I'm just checking everything technically is working. Uh, so, slowly, we'll let people in. How you doing? Uh, wow. Let's see, a lot of people here. So, um, in the meantime, let's see who we could talk to. Jason, I see you, Jason Reynolds. How are you doing? I cannot hear you. Doing very well, thank you. Hi. Good. Where are you from? Boston, Massachusetts. Boston. Wow. What time is it there? It is uh, almost noon. Almost noon. Okay. Good to meet you. Nice to, nice to have you here. Let's see if who else I can talk to while people are coming in. I'm just going to scroll through. Lucia. Lucia Ter, Terhel? Ter who? Hey. <laughs> Where are you from? Um, well, I, I was born in Mexico, but I'm French Mexican. You are in Mexico now? Are you French? No, nope, I'm in the United States. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, good to see you here. That's it's amazing, by the way, that like we're doing it across the universe. Almost, I thought a lot of people from Europe will be here, uh, but there's people from the United States. Um, okay, because uh, it's really early in the uh, United States, or somewhat early. Um, it's noon. <laughs> noon. Okay, let's see who else. Uh, Craig Smith. Hi. Hey, nice to meet you. How you doing? Where are you from? Hey, I'm good, thanks. I'm in London at the moment. London. Oh, wow. That's cool. So um, it's amazing to, to have you here. Uh, it's really cool to have you guys here. I'm just slowly letting the flood of people in. There's also people on, uh, on, on YouTube that are watching. So I'm just checking that YouTube is working. OK, so I, I will start uh, and we will talk for the next 10 minutes or so, and then we will start the conversation with Alan. Um, so first of all, I wanted to kind of mention the differences between the, U the online and off offline, what the power of online event like this could be. Because, you know, if you remember, it was not too long ago when we used to go out of the house and go to the online offline events and you know, dress up and go with the car and sit in a, in a hall. And then you watch the presentation and that usually, you know, you sit politely, quietly until the end of the conversation, till the end of the presentation. And then you ask a question or two and then you go home. Uh, well, it's just good. But, you know, but, but what happens there is that you pay attention for the duration of the talk. You really are in, the, in it. And what's missing when we're online is that it's, there's a lot of distractions. You know, our phones is on, people are in the other rooms. So I would say to you, uh, turn, turn off all the distractions, be, be with us for the hour, allow yourself this, this hour to learn and to be a part of it. And what's, what else uh, in the power of this moment is that the chat is continuously going. And I, it was it kind of blew my mind when we first started to do online stuff is that people don't wait to the end to talk. They're actually chatting uh, throughout the presentation, throughout the conversation and answering each other. So I'd like to encourage that. Please answer each other, uh, talk to each other, get to know each other. Uh, and I think that's the power of being live with us today because um, you know, if you watch it later on YouTube, you know, sometimes, you know, you fast forward, you don't really pay attention. It, it's it, the power of the power of the live event is the chat, I think, and being together all. And I want to know, everyone brought their coffee with them? Let me see your mugs. Yes, bring it up so we can take a photo of this. Wait, I want to see you. Who bring coffee? Oh, no. Who, who is not? Who didn't bring this coffee? Me. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I can oh. get one. <laughs> well, that's called Yux on Coffee. The, the idea behind it is that we're all having coffee together um, and, uh, you know, enjoying a, a casual conversation. So that's the whole idea, uh, you know, having coffee with, with colleagues and friends. It doesn't have to be coffee. It could be whiskey. 
I have tea. <laughs> tea is good. Whiskey is good. good. Beer is good. Wine. What else you got there? <laughs> Different type of tea. Okay. Um, so that being said, um, also, I want to kind of help um, ask for people to take out their phone and follow UX Salon on Instagram. Look for UX Salon. Um, I try to bring an, another angle to user experience learning uh, on Instagram. So make, you know, have it and have fun along the way. So if you can follow us and uh, if you do that, look for UX Salon, take a photo of you watching this event, hold the cup of coffee in your hand, take a photo, please post it on Instagram and tag UX Salon or send me a DM with a photo. I'll use it. It's going to be cool to see all those, you know, cups of coffee floating uh, in our event. Um, Okay, because um, uh, we're waiting for some people, I, I, I made a survey to see where most people are coming from, just to kind of get an idea. So I'd like to send out this poll right now um, and just vote, where are you from in the world? So I have a question. <laughs> Who's I'm that? from Costa Rica, me, Veronica. Costa, okay. I'm from Costa Rica. So usually yeah. in Costa Rica, they teach us that we are from Central America. So wow. I have only Southern North. <laughs> so uh, okay. which one is it for you? I guess South America is the, uh, the more appropriate one. But you're right. I, I saw that. I, sh I thought, should I add Central America? But I thought, no, it's no one from, from you know, no one from the Caribbeans will be here. Yeah. So I didn't add that. I mean... <laughs> Well, thanks for being here. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, that being said, uh, let's see who is, uh, I'm gonna end the poll in, in a few seconds. So the majority of people seems to be from Europe. Um, here, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So you can see some people from Asia. Who is here from Asia? Oh, yes, from Iran, I see. Uh, from Iran, right? My, my, Mahul? No, uh, I'm, I'm from India. India, I'm from okay. Yeah. Bangalore, yeah. wow, that's so cool. I wanted uh, to say I'm actually from South America, but I live in Europe, so I didn't know which one to put. I just put Europe, though. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so, upcoming events. I'm going to go quickly because we want to go into the conversation. We have three upcoming events. Uh, practical UX research. It's a three-day uh, workshop with Amanda Stockwell online. It's going to be amazing. Check out uh, Nir. Please, Nir is helping us. Please paste in the chat uh, what uh, you know links to that. Making remote work work. Vitaly. Vitaly is our co-host today. Uh, we're going to speak about how to create, uh, how to work remotely, or what's the what's the juice of it. Give me one liner. Well, essentially, it's all about how to actually make remote work work in different situations where you end up in this, you know, we're dealing in a very complicated world. We need to make sure that it's actually working somehow. So this is what the workshop is all about. It's communication, it's collaboration, it's tooling, it's everything in between as well. Because, you know, it's a different, everyone is doing design now remotely, Alan. It's like, uh, it's crazy. It's not no longer making the, meeting in the office. So uh, I think that's, yeah. Alan? Maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, the, the next event will be UX Fail, which we're going to have five glorious failure stories uh, and uh, lessons learned because, you know, if, uh, failure, if you don't learn from failure, you, uh, yeah, you got to learn from failures. So that's, uh, that's going to be next uh, month. So please make sure to sign up for that. So uh, that logistics out of the way, we're almost ready. I want to introduce our co-host, first of all, uh, Joanna, Joanna T T Tolano, Toledo, Toleno. Yes, say hi so we can hear you. Um, hi, hi. It's great to be here, and uh, I'm honored by this invitation. Thank you, Abby. So, Joanna is a UX manager at UI Perth Path, uh, and a really cool thought leader running UX goodies on Instagram. If you haven't followed her, you're probably the only one. It's like, you know, I think that the entire universe of UX is following you. I don't know if it's possible to have more. Uh, so follow her at newxgoodies.com. Uh, and uh, we have also Vitaly Friedman, which is joining us. Uh, uh, Vitaly is a good friend, co-founder of Smashing Magazine, and one of the hardest working person I know. But that's not uh, true at all. I just drink a lot of coffee every day. That's all. But hello, everyone. <laughs> 
So I'm happy to have you here. Um, My pleasure as also well. Also, a shout out to um, Kathleen, Kathleen Sutherland. Is she here? Kathleen. Kathleen Sutherland. No? I saw her post on LinkedIn and I wanted to say hi and thank you for, um, for doing that. Okay, that's it. Without further ado, uh, Alan Cooper. I thought, uh, I thought how to introduce you. Uh, I mean, everyone should know you, but I thought, and I saw this, uh, the title you have in your Instagram, uh, and your, I'm sorry, on your Twitter, ancestry, ancestry thinker, software alchemist, and a regenerative research uh, rancher. What's that? Tell me about that a little bit. Uh, which one? The, the rancher. Uh, that's a new thing, right? A new title. Regenerative. Regenerative. Yeah, you say it. Yeah, re, re, now I can't say it after listening to you. I it. <laughs> it's regenerative rancher. So um, the, <laughs> the indigenous peoples of America learned how to live sustainably on the land and did so for thousands of years. And then those damn Europeans came to our shores and brought European agricultural techniques with them, uh, among other things. And uh, sorry, I'm, I don't mean to, to cast aspersions on Europeans, but um, uh, being of Euro descent myself, uh, but they brought uh, European agricultural techniques and, um, and they don't work. And then what we did is we mechanized those techniques and they work even worse. And so um, and in particular, they don't work in semi-desert areas and California is a semi-desert. And so here we get uh, 30 inches of rain a year, less than a meter. Um, and, uh, and those conventional agricultural methods uh, turn into extractive techniques and they, they, hmm the soil of its goodness and it goes away after a couple hundred years and uh, here in California as in all, pretty much all of the United States we're facing a, an agricultural crisis of soil degradation and in in semi-arid lands all it's really good for is is grazing and but but conventional western grazing really destroys the land so in my tiny little plot here this is a retirement project we're trying to restore the soil. And we have a small flock of about 50 sheep and, um, and they're our number one tool. We're doing uh, regenerative, we're doing what's called intensive rotational grazing. And that's where we're doing, um, it's, uh, uh, we're trying to simulate the way it was before uh, the land was, was fenced and, uh, mm. and and in, uh, and conventional European stuff was implemented here. So it's a soil restoration project. We're trying to regenerate the soil. It turns out that you can bring soil back. Um, you can sequester carbon in it. You can sequester moisture in it, and you can build up the topsoil through uh, um, by not overgrazing and by not over tilling and by not over fertilizing and pesticiding and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. it's a it's very expensive to do that. It, there's no money in it. Uh, okay. So, I mean, but it's a tiny little experiment, and there's been a lot of research done on it. And it turns out that it's it's um, it's actually the people who who the scientists who study this is see it as um, I mean, even if we stop uh, putting out carbon, putting carbon in the atmosphere, how do you recover? A, a climatological balance. And it turns out that soil restoration is one of the key methods. It's one of the few that will do it. Hmm. So I'm really cool. that. And I've seen, actually, I've seen some of your videos near, maybe you can post the link to is you. You have a YouTube channel where you're now your new career, a carpentry. I've seen some amazing things that you're doing. So that's cool. Uh, and uh, so, but, but on, on that, uh, I want to first of all, explain to the audience why we have the cross hair on your face. Well, it's, it's, uh, I mean, if you're really cool and sophisticated and, huh. uh, and, and with it, then you're going to have these crosshairs. Uh, if you're, you know, like a, you know, a second class citizen, then you're not going to have crosshairs. <laughs> Actually, that's not true at all. Uh, 
I worked really hard on my audio video setup and I spent two days getting this camera set up and it never did that until I came into the office this morning and turned it on. And now I can't figure out how to make those crosshairs go away. No worries about it. Welcome, Welcome to the UX jungle. <laughs> We're just happy that you're here and uh, thank you. So I will ask Joanna, Joanna, start, uh, let's start the conversation. Let's go, let's go. Um, totally. Um, I'd say we start with a um, very cool conversation opener, like an icebreaker if you want. And I know that it's one that Alan uh, actually wanted to talk about. So um, it's sort of a very compelling game if you want. It reminds me of the Y laddering in UX design. It's um, in the sense that it's a very layered exercise. And the name of the game is, what is the most important thing? So, Alan, what's the most of the most important thing in UX design? What's the most important thing in a product? What's the most important thing to you? And ultimately, what's the most important thing for humanity? Well, that's that's exactly the thing is that is thank you. If you, you know, I should, before I get into this, let me just say to everybody who's listening, everybody who's tuned in, thank you very much for coming. I'm I'm flattered and I'm honored that you're here. Uh, Avi says that we've we've hit the limit on the number of people that Zoom allows in. That's that's pretty incredible. And I really appreciate that you are that you're interested in what I have to say. And I hope I can I can deliver. And when when Avi first asked me if I would participate in this, I thought, well, it'll be a nice chat. They'll ask me about anecdotes about the industry and, and it'll be a, a, a puff piece, you know? And then I thought, I thought, no, there's gotta be a, a, a solid center to this. And I thought, well, what's, what's the most important thing? And I realized that this is a question that can be asked and answered at many different levels. And so the first thing I, I did is I, is I said, well, the most important thing is undo. Because <laughs> you, you simply cannot have an interaction with a machine unless you can undo what you've done. And, and then I realized that I wrote down, I said, Antarctica has been explored better than the capabilities of undo. Of course, as I was reading this later in the day, that was the day that the that the Mars lander landed, the Perseverance landed on Mars. And I thought, whoa, Mars has been better explored than undo. <laughs> I mean, there's undo. Sure, you push the button and it reverses the last function. But what if you want to re reverse the function second to last, but not the last? That's a difficult problem. So now there are there are there are tools that do this, but there are certainly no <laughs> tools for uh, for average users. Like I find uh, I'm using a a, a, a three dimensional CAD program called Fusion 360 to design some of my components that I 3D print, and that has. Uh, a very sophisticated and very difficult to use, I should say, a very badly designed method for, um, for actually going back and undoing the second to last function. So it's certainly there. I mean, other things like, let's say you delete something and then you delete something else. Okay, well, you lost the first thing you deleted. What if you wanna recover that, but not recover the, the most recent thing you've deleted? Again, these are these are things that, that I was thinking about how to do them 30 years ago. So it's not like this is new or new technology or innovative. It's just that nobody gives a shit because nobody pays money for this kind of stuff. They say, oh God, we got to have undo because if we don't have undo, we're going to have bad reviews. But undo is incredibly powerful and really important. And it, it should be more powerful. It should be more capable. And um, and that doesn't mean you, that I want to take away from a very simple uh, control Z or undo from the menu. Um, so <clears throat> I thought, okay, well, what else is important in interface design? And I, uh, it's, and this is something that I think is the Apple company. Apple 
they make my phone, they make my computer, they make my watch, they, they, they do everything. They tuck me into bed at night, but they really are shitty at this idea of revealing state and process is I want to know what my system is doing. And I want to know what are the consequences of the actions that I take? What are, <clears throat> what are the alternative actions that I can take? And what are their consequences? What is the process that we're going through? When I push this button, where does it take me and why? And what state am I in right now? And, and Apple products that has, they've long had this Steve Jobsian philosophy of it would simplify things a lot if we didn't communicate all that stuff. And that's true, it does, but it also makes them um, not good. Now, if what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to reveal state and process and consequences and alternatives, then, then that's a much more difficult interaction design problem. So, I mean, this leads me to one of my aphorisms, which is the, the um, you can make things simpler and easy to use by depowering them, by taking away capabilities. But that's just shitty, lazy, no good design, and don't do it. The, the real challenge is to give more capabilities without making it more complicated. I mean, this is something that the Fusion 360 people have done. That's um, Autodesk. Is They've added all these capabilities in, but they're not easier. So it takes years of study to get good at that, to be able to undo the second previous thing that you did. Well, that's just crappy UX design. We can do better UX design than that. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other stuff. But as I started to, years ago at uh, Cooper, in I think in my first book, I, I talked about one of the principles we used at Cooper called RIVMUF, which is a corrupted pronunciation of an acronym, R-V-M-F, which stands for Rich Visual Modeless Feedback. The idea that you should be able to look at the screen and it should be telling you consequences, alternatives, process, and state in a way that doesn't intrude on you with, with dialogue boxes or menus. It just, if you want to know, you can look right there on the screen and there it is. Um, you can also tell from this discussion that I'm an old computer guy. I don't think in terms of a handheld computer. And, and, and I'm, I apologize for that. And I know that most of you are designing for tiny little screens. It's like looking at the world through a keyhole and, and you can't do much, but I'm unconvinced that these tiny little screens are in fact the mode of computation that is gonna, is gonna dominate. Uh, and I'm, I remain unconvinced of that. Uh, I mean, I, it's, I think everybody is always going to have a tiny little screen for auxiliary actions, but for primary actions, for doing sophisticated tasks with a computer, yeah, I don't know. No, I don't know. I, I'm prepared to be wrong on that. Um, okay, so, so those are the kind of things is like, like what's important in interface design, but then you can start saying, well, what's important in, in the practice when you actually have when you're actually trying to get something done. And um, the most important thing is, is uh, to not work alone and to not work in large groups, large being three people or more. <laughs> if you, I mean, this is my assertion is that the best design happens when you work in groups that are larger than one and less than three, you do the math. Um, it's certainly the agile programmers figured that out a long time ago. And um, so there are other things like get out of the office. I mean, it's really hard to design in when you're isolated in your office or in your home office or in front of your computer. You need to, you need to do qualitative interviews with actual users, not with stakeholders, not with subject matter experts. You do need to listen to stakeholders and subject matter experts. That's true. 
But what you really need to do is you really need to listen to actual users. And, and actual users will lie to you because they're paid to lie to you. So you need to figure out a way to get around that. That's hard. And, and that's what, uh, that's why I say that the best interviewing technique is two beers. It's <laughs> also, it takes people a while to get to trust you to where they'll say things that are, that are um, worthwhile hearing. And so a lot of uh, organizations say, well, okay, we'll have a, a one hour interview. Okay. Well, I've always found that the, the most revealing things come out of about an hour and 10 minutes into the interview. Cause it takes about an hour for somebody to decide that they can trust you. So that's problematic. That's difficult. That's expensive. You know, and that's, that's what it takes. Okay. So moving up the hierarchy, then you say, well, okay, well, what's important in the UX profession? And, um, then you start getting more philosophical things like not designing is simply bad design. So if you decide to push something away and say, well, we're not going to tackle that now, what you're saying is I am going to proactively do shitty design. Okay. Own it. Um, I think you have to, you have to say, um, uh, you have to get everyone acquainted with the elephant in the room. You know, this, I think that what everybody does is they, is they look at the things they say, well, yeah, that's a tough problem, but we can't solve that here. And so everybody walks around that elephant in the room and and you, you do not have the luxury of doing that. As a professional, you don't, you can't do that. It's, it's like, it's the, you know, a, a, a doctor, you know, who has the Hippocratic Oath. You can't, you can't just say, well, I'm going to ignore that here because it's really too difficult to save that person's life. You can't do that. You know, and, and so, and so this is hard. And this is expensive, and your boss doesn't like you to even talk about that crap. <laughs> it really sucks to be you. I, that's all I have to say. Okay, so um, being user centered means not being designer centered. Nobody cares about your clever ideas. So. For example, and again, let me use Apple. I used to I used to kick Microsoft all the time just because they were the they were the biggest, you know, giant blob of protoplasm that I could kick around. So now I, you know, now I kick around Apple. Steve Jobs has this uh, what's his name? Um, uh, the German designer who he Honey, I Peter Roms. Dieter Rahm. Oh, okay. Dieter Rahm's aesthetic. Dieter Rahm's aesthetic is really beautiful and really wonderful and really delightful. And it is really good. If you happen to prefer the style of Dieter Rahm's. And if you don't prefer the style of Dieter Rahm's, then that Dieter Rahm's aesthetic is ugly and stupid and offensive. It's not good design, it's style, okay? A lot of people like that style. And Steve Jobs, that was this hill that he decided to die on, pretty much literally. But it's not the style of a lot of people. And so what, <laughs> what, what that is, is that's designer-centered design. That was, you will accept my aesthetic. And, and the thing is, is that, is that I don't mind. I mean, any product that you use is going to, you're going to confront the designer's aesthetic. Uh, but I believe that they, that, that a lot of companies take their design aesthetic, their stylistic choices, and let those override good interaction design choices. 
And I think that's a failure. That's not user centered, that's designer centered. It's a triumph of style over substance. So, okay. So <laughs> I, uh, I have some. Ellen, just one thing. Uh, I'm getting some reports. People are saying that there is a pitch noise in the, in the microphone. Maybe try to plug it in uh, or. Uh, I, I don't. And I also don't. a lot of people agree with you. They say, I think you know, Apple deserves it. That's some of the comments here. And um, so. I'm not sure what to do about the buzz. Oh, okay. there's some some pitch noise. I don't know. Maybe uh, it's like a high pitch buzz. Perhaps the connection of the microphone or anything you can. Or oh, maybe headphones. This could also be the case. Everyone is hearing that, or is this just some? It, it might be better now. It might be better. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, gone. It's great. It's still oh, okay. I just uh, better. built some uh, jacks. Yeah, yeah, it's got on and off. So no, that's I, true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I know. I've been kind of talking nonstop here for a while. It's this coming is... back whenever he's whenever. I think song from Adam's device. Say again. It may not necessarily come from Alan Cooper. It may be from somebody else who has it muted their device. Oh, please, everyone, mute. I will mute also. Alan, go ahead, continue. Uh, what's the most important thing for humanity? I think well, all of us like mute already. Let's. Uh, um, all right. I mean, I finally get to going up this hierarchy there are a lot of there are a lot of steps here but when i finally get to the question of what is ultimately the most important it gets as as you might expect it gets to goals and so i tried to write this down this morning to 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 say it as succinctly as possible and this is what i wrote when your number one job is serving to the needs of users and some external force tries to divert your efforts to some other goal, your number one job now changes to removing that external force. It doesn't matter if that external force has greater economic or political power than you do. Your job is clear. Mm -hmm. I love this. This is super powerful. And there's a lot of un to unpack to everything you said, but this, I think it's uh, ultimately what every designer needs to take in and what I would love that we all take home from this conversation. And uh, just a follow-up question on what you just said. Would it be a good idea for designers to have a Hippocrates oath <laughs> that for themselves? So maybe we take an oath that we're responsible for uh, our profession and the decisions we make in our everyday work. And uh, thank you. That's a good question. No, no, I don't believe in the Hippocratic Oath. I, I think that words are words and I'm interested in actions. And um, <laughs> should we have a violent revolution with fighting in the street? I think that would be more valuable than a Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> so when... If you're in the business of making, oh, I don't know, dynamite. <laughs> I you mean, the guy who invented dynamite, Alfred Nobel, said, oh, shit, look what I did. I did a terrible thing. Now, if you're digging a tunnel or building a roadway or something. You love dynamite. Dynamite's a very powerful and useful tool. And it's done a lot for humanity. But it also has done terrible, terrible things. And Nobel, to atone for his innovation, created the, the prize, There's the eponymous prize. 
So what do you do if you invent Twitter or Facebook? And there's no doubt that Twitter is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And Facebook is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But what is the legacy of dynamite? Is it the trenches of World War I? Or is it building railroads? What is the legacy of dynamite? And what's the legacy of Twitter? What's the legacy of Facebook? Well, you know, as a as a tool guy, I've got a I've got a workshop here filled with tools, which is to say they're very powerful, sharp implements, and I can kill people with them, including myself. So <laughs> it's the I mean, there's a it has to do with the humans who wield these tools and what their intent is. Um since since I've retired, I, I've been doing a lot of reading about politics and history and economics and, and race. And it's very clear, it's become very clear in my mind that there, um, that there are two human forces the natural human force of cooperation and the natural human force of competition and um, and the natural human force of cooperation is what civilization is built on. And it has been dogged and slowed and held back by the forces of competition the forces of competition are kind of an end justifies the means thing. It's just like, if I can make somebody fearful for their life, I can make them do my bidding, which will be good for my personal uh, situation. And thus we get aristocracy and um, capitalism. And the forces of cooperation are, are how people say, instead of me taking what you have, Let's pool what you have and what I have together, and the the sum total will be greater than the than just the addition of the two parts. And uh, so, to move forward as as a as humanity, it's very clear to me that that we need to we need to build our society on on cooperation and not on competition. Um, and so when I started in the world of computer programming in the early 1970s, it was a, it was a, a world dominated by large businesses doing technology for money. And I was part of a small cadre of revolutionaries who were a bunch of, uh, former hippies who dropped acid in the 60s and 70s and 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 listened to different music and did things in a different way and we went holy crap we can buy our own computer instead of instead of um relying on giant corporations putting you know allowing us to visit their multi-million dollar uh computers, we could go out and buy our own. And this was the spark for a revolution, a rev revolution of technology and innovation. And the microcomputer revolution ran until it became the personal computer revolution, until it became the, the networked revolution and then the mobile computer revolution. But what happened was some years into it, um, I mean, I started because I wanted to make money. I had no money and I had no, I mean, I had a job, but it was, I wasn't making much money. I wasn't going anywhere. I was writing programs for a, a shipping company. And, um, and I thought, wow, I could make $50,000 a year, which at the time was the biggest number I could think of. And, uh, and that was my aspiration. And, and then I got to, <laughs> after, 
after a couple of years, I had a success. I, I would pay myself $50,000 a year. And I, I thought I was the, the most successful guy on the face of the planet. Um, and then I began to realize that I could make real money. You know, and that's when I began to face a series of decisions. And, uh, and one of my colleagues, a guy who like me, started his little software company in the same year I started my little software company. I watched him start to make, start to face those same decisions. And he answered every one of those decisions differently than I did. And his name is Bill Gates. And, and so I, I joke, I say, I'm a self-made thousandaire. I, I'm not complaining. I've, I've, I've done just fine. But but I watched the compromises that Gates had to make to make all that money. And I didn't want to make those compromises. Uh, he asked me to join his company in the 80s. If I had joined Microsoft in the 80s, I'd be a rich man. Uh, but I would be a compromised man. And I didn't want to do that. And I told him no. And I'm, I think that was the right decision. Um, but what happened was in the late 80s, early 90s, the, it became clear to everybody how much money there was to be made in this new industry of individual computing. And in, the, in through the 90s and into the aughts, it, my industry that I was a plank owner in, a founder of this, this personal computing industry ceased to be about users and technology and innovation. And it became about money, solely and only about money. And the industry became overwhelmed by money. And the people who want money more than anything, and people who want money more than anything tend to want power more than anything, um, came in and took over the industry. And and really changed it. So from my point of view, there is no tech industry. There is no computer industry. There's no innovation industry. All there is is the money industry. And it's all about money. And the people who come in and thrive do it for money. And you and you can see, you can see a guy like Elon Musk. I, I don't know Elon Musk. I've never met him. I don't know much about him. But I, I read stories about him. Let's say, oh, yeah, when he was an undergraduate, he used to fantasize about landing on Mars and electrifying the world and building electric cars and all that stuff. But now I see him making decisions that are about money and, and not about serving the world. And you see the same stories about Mark Zuckerberg and, and, uh, and Jack at Twitter and Jack Dorsey and, and, uh, and, uh, Jeff Bezos and all these guys, they're not, they're not technologists, you know? I mean, I was a painter when I was in school, but I'm not a painter <laughs> there, you know, and they may have been technologists when they were in college, but they're not technologists. They're financiers, they're tycoons, they're industrialists, they're robber barons. And um, so you would have to say, what business do you want to be in? Do you want to be in the business of serving people or do you want to be in the business of making money? Because if Mark Zuckerberg owns the company, he's going to make decisions that allow him to make money, not decisions that allow him to serve users. And if users get thrown under the bus, he'll make those decisions because he'll make more money that way. And so this is why you see somebody like Jack Dorsey, who is just a kind of a, an unaligned technology. Again, I don't know Jack Dorsey, so I'm just you know speculating here. But he looked to me like a normal technologist building some cool technology for the web. And uh, then he discovered that, oh, he could make more than 50000 a year. He could make lots of money. And so he started making the decisions that he had to make 
to make a lot of money. And, um, and he had to make incredible compromises along the way. So an amazing thing happened in the United States of America on January 9th. Um, the man who was the, um, who was the president of the United States from 16 to 20, he lost the election in November and he left office on the 20th of January. But on the 9th of January, his Twitter account was shut down. I don't know about other people, but I, out here in, the, in cow country, I could feel an enormous, ah, a sigh of relief, a profound, uh, it, was like, it was like riding a wild horse and finally being able to, to stop and get off of it, to have that awful voice silenced. It, <laughs> it was clear to me that while an enormous amount of damage was done by the president, an equal amount of damage was done by his presence on Twitter, on social media. And what we have created today is, is um, weaponized technology that makes money for a few people. I mean, the reason why that happened and the reason why Jack Dorsey did not remove that man from Twitter four years ago is because he made a buttload of money. And I have no respect for that. And I think the same is true through the pandemic to watch the actions of the, the technology tycoons making decisions that were all good for themselves. And, um, you know, and I could go to the store, and I could buy a shirt for $8, you know, and that's it's a wonderful thing, except the fact that I can buy a shirt for $8 means that there are slaves somewhere making it and their lives being destroyed in order for me to have, be able to buy a shirt that is so inexpensive that if I decide that I'm, I don't want it, I could just throw it away and buy another one. Uh, and, and so here's the thing is when the CEOs and the founders of the companies make these decisions, that trickles down. You know that trickle down theory? Is that if, if you give all the money to the people at the top, it'll get distributed to the rest of the society? That's bullshit and lies. It doesn't work that way. Money goes up, but it turns out that morality trickles down. And so the United States has had a very bold and clear demonstration that you can be amoral, that you can be unethical, and it will be good for you. And there's a lot of latent shit in, in all human societies. And when you have somebody at the top giving permission, then people take that permission. And so what I said about the elephant in the room, you know, and not designing is a design decision, is when the people at the top say, no, let's not worry about what's good for people. Let's worry about what's good for the bottom line. Then, uh, then at each level down, the managers and the executives say, okay, I understand what I have to do to move forward. And they, and they do that. And, and it gets down to where you're a practitioner, say. And, um, and as a practitioner, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do good design work for your user community, okay? But 
you're also young and ambitious and you want to have a nice life and you want to prepare your family. And, and so your boss is saying to you, if you want to get ahead in this company, you have to make the company money. And if that means you have to s- step on the toes of the user community, then step on the toes, do it nicely because you're a UX professional. <laughs> hmm. And, and so what happens is, 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 is you, you've, as a practitioner, you can make decisions for what's good for your user. But as you want to, as, to grow your career, you're faced with that decision. Which way do you go? Do you continue to serve your user community or do you serve your boss? I think that indeed... Oh. Toxic leadership can normalize uh, uh, this toxic mindset throughout the organization. And indeed, it's just like in trickle-down economics that in the end, everybody in in a particular organization will start going by those normalized toxic decision-making and processes and so on. But my question is, uh, is it? I think it's really hard. I'm coming from a place where I'm not sure that I would be able to completely stand up against my leadership. And I'm wondering whether this should be more, if you want, as you mentioned earlier, a revolution in which the entire industry is doing that. And we're all standing up for each other because otherwise just one person in a big company, it, it can be very discouraging. And I think Difficult. I mean, I have all the admiration for anyone who would do that, but I'm not sure there are many people who can, yeah, jeopardize their job stability and their family being uh, financially stable and so on. So I think that maybe a group revolution is the way to go, right? <laughs> so let me, yes, let me just say that it is not an accident that people find themselves in the economic bind on the horns of the economic dilemma. You can do what's right or you can survive. This is not an accident. This is, there is abundant historical uh, precedent for this. It is how aristocrats work. It is how the world, I I know I sound like a socialist and, but I'm not, I, you know, I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't come at this from the point of view of, of, of an ism. I come at this from the point of view of, of you know, when I left the, the world of, of doing design, doing software for money, I was, I, was, I was disillusioned by what I saw. And I set out to educate myself. What's going wrong here? And, and, um, and it's very clear. Is that is that the reason why mine workers have a shitty time of it is because if they if they had um, an alternative way of living, they wouldn't do such a an insecure job in an unsafe way. They only do it that way because they're they're forced to it, and. And this is what I see across the technology world today is UX designers are not doing this by choice. I mean, they're they're saying, oh, I'm a UX designer rather than being a print designer or rather than being a programmer or rather than, you know, driving a Uber. But but their but but their behavior on the job is one of, well, you know, I. I think this is the right way to go, but my boss is leaning on me. My boss is saying, you have to do this. So I have to do this because I don't want to get fired. I need my job. I have my house, my kids. That's by design. And it's called oppression. And, and so, so the, the bad news is, yeah, it's a revolution is how's, how we're going to fix this. And the really bad news is that revolutions in general don't work. Okay, I mean, most revolutions are are you usurped or suborned or overwhelmed or internally taken over and 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 subverted. Uh, I mean, the the track record of revolutions sucks, but I don't see an alternative. So the good news is that. The technology business. Becomes 
the money business. All businesses are the money business. So it means that the person who makes a pizza for you or who drives your Uber or who fixes your plumbing or who writes your code or who designs your, your interface, they all have the same job, which is trying to keep their heads above the economic sea. <laughs> and so, so the good news is that everybody, you know, who isn't uh, taking money from everybody else is on our side. And so a revolution actually has a good chance of winning. I mean, it's, it doesn't take away from its chances of being ruined, as revolutions are, but it's, um, we're all in the same boat. And, 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 and also the people who, who have money and who have power are uh, completely open about their, their inhuman ways, their non um, uh, collaborative, non ethical. Unethical, yeah. The thing is, is that ethics people interpret things like having a gun to protect myself as ethical behavior. So that can be subverted. But but the idea that that um, looking out for yourself as opposed to looking out for the society is uh, the people who are doing that are are pretty upfront that they don't give a shit about you. And they don't care if the world comes crashing down as long as they don't. And uh, you know, look, let me just say here that I know Angel. I, I have a hard time living the way I see these things. I, I, can, I can talk about them. It's really easy for me to sit here on my little ranch in, in Marin County, California, and talk about revolution. It's really easy. And, and am I going to go out there with a gun and, <laughs> and, and get on the barricades? I don't think so. I'm an old part. I'm not going to do that. And so, so I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be saying to anybody, Hey, <laughs> while I'm sitting here safe, <laughs> you go out there and fight. <laughs> I think that's disingenuous. I think that's wrong. Okay. But, yeah. Alan, I'd like to stop you because we have a very short time left and we have so many questions. Um, Vitaly, perhaps yes. you can uh, take it from here. Yes, I've been very patient. I'm, uh, I like to listen to Alan speaking always <laughs> and I can just almost fall asleep as well. Uh, but actually, what's, I think it's very important for me because you mentioned a lot of many, uh, many things that really resonate well with me and with the work that I'm doing as well. And one thing that kind of that I found really, really difficult and what I see people really struggling with when it comes to design, interface design, UX, anything really at this point, is the notion of the first steps, I think. Uh, because when I look around, you know, um, almost like 20 years ago, you wrote the book where you mentioned how we're going to move towards user-centered design, uh, how we're going to kind of apply interaction design to do the right thing, right? And it's very similar to what you're saying today as well. But if I look around today, right, I find a lot of, tough fights that every single person who is on this call today, I think, will be fighting almost you know, every day in the company. That means I need to convince somebody of the importance of accessibility. I need to convince somebody of the importance of usability. I need to convince somebody to invest money into user research and all that. Uh, and at the same time, we see all these things happening around us, very much like you mentioned, because of privacy, where data is being consumed and gathered and evaluated and sold and resold and so on and so forth. It doesn't really paint a really nice picture of the web as we ended up with today. So my question would be then, what would be then the first step? So if you want to move away from this and you want to really turn the ship up 
kind of the other direction. Uh, how are we going to proceed that to actually finally make a difference in 2021? Or is it all kind of gone and forgotten? There is no way back. Uh, thank you. That's a question. The, so <clears throat> here's the, the thing about, about private enterprise is it may or may not give a shit about the welfare of citizens. Okay. Um, I think the same is true of governments. I think the governments may or may not give a shit about citizens, but but I think the only place where you can you can reliably invest your time and effort is in in governments in the collective the general welfare, the common good, because private organizations are, simply aren't going to do that. They don't, it, it, an interesting thing happens. I mean, there are companies that are, that, that are, that are, um, that care for the, the welfare of citizens. But as soon as they start getting big and making a lot of money, then money people come in. And the money people don't care. So I don't think there are any big companies that really care about the the the, the welfare of citizens. I just don't think that's a that's an avenue to pursue. Because ultimately, every private company in an in an unconstrained capitalistic world turns bad. They turn towards money at whatever cost. And so, so you have no, you know, when a company is, is big enough to do something about the state of the world, um, it's not going to. All right. All right. When a government is big enough, it might. It might not, but, but but my point is is that is that you have a chance with a government, and you don't have a chance with private enterprise. Right. So the people right. who have suffered under horrible oppressive governments go, oh, I hate the government; they're not terrible. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, being an old fart in America, I remember when our government was pretty good. You know, before Ronald Reagan. It actually gave a shit. It was a, you know, it was about liberal democracy. I mean, it had horrible, horrible flaws, but it it also had an enormous amount of promise, and it was headed in the right direction. But every single private organization that I see is not no hope, no hope there. And and the private organizations put an enormous amount of time and effort into uh into lying about that and and one of the things they do is they put a lot of money into philanthropy a lot of ceos put a lot of money into philanthropy so they'll make a billion dollars off oppressing people and then they'll spend a million dollars to give money back to those people so anand giridiridas who wrote winners take all talks about this um about uh it's it's whitewashing of their reputations. And so, so what I'm saying is, where do you start? Mm. You start with government because there's no other path that, that there's a chance that government will get you there. There's no chance that private enterprise will get you there. Yeah, so when we look around, of course, when we look at the governments around the world, Fame, like a lot of nationalist movements that are not necessarily helping with our cause. Um, and it's, you know, it's always kind of going to with an inertia because the vast majority of people is going in a particular direction. It's very, very difficult to fight back. But I think that maybe one of the interesting points to look into would be kind of to learn 
how to push your ideas like how do you negotiate your ideas how do you push your skills and that brings me to this idea of what would you kind of suggest to people wonderful people here in the chat here as well um, as necessary skills to have like if you think about investing time and effort and maybe money into some specific ux skills or ux related skills or just general human kind skills right um, be it you know attending workshops or master classes or reading books or anything to educate yourself where would you recommend people to go to really get better at first of all at what they do but also as a human being as well in you know these days i think that you have to you you have to you have to the <laughs> you have to find the, <laughs> the, the there's there's truth out there and it's not easy to find. It's not easy to isolate from, from the, the propaganda and the mechanisms of propaganda that we have built and designed and deployed to the world are incredibly powerful and incredibly misleading. And, um, and I think that what you have to do is you have to You have to educate yourself. You have to learn about um, the lies that are being told to you by people who make a lot of money off those lies. And um, it, it, look, one of the things that has fascinated me all my life is, is war. I, I confess, I, I'm, I'm a student of, of war and, 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 and weaponry. I mean, the engineer in me loves the technology of airplanes and tanks and all that stuff. And, um, and so I indulge my interest. I read a lot. Um, I've never been in the military. Um, but one of the things that you learn is that, is that war is a horrible, terrible thing. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And the, the <laughs> who is it who said the first casualty of war is truth? That may be true, but by far and away, the largest casualty of war is the civilian population and the civil infrastructure. War destroys people, not necessarily combatants. And so when I talk about revolution, I'm terrified of something like that because because if it does come to a real fight people are destroyed by the millions it's a terrible horrible thing and i don't want that to happen so i want to have a peaceful uh change i want to take power away from the aristocrats and put it into the hands of the people because i trust the people they will make mistakes because they are human, but they will make fewer mistakes than aristocrats will. And um, the, the thing is, is that the aristocrats have all these tools of propaganda at their disposal, and we don't. So a lot of what we know is wrong, and it's incumbent on ourselves to educate ourselves, to learn what's true about economics. So, so when the president of the United States says that, that the economy is good, you have to be able to unpack that statement to see what it really means. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's a hard job. It's hard, you know, and you'll notice that when I had a company and was working for a living, I didn't, I didn't divert a lot of my energy to learning about that. I've only been able to do that since I've had the luxury of having a lot of free time. So I recognize how problematic that is, but I also recognize how necessary that is. Right. I mean, the challenges that we face as a society today are as great as they have ever been. 
damn. Well, I'm sure we have an opportunity over the next couple of decades or so and uh, to change that because in my view, and then I, I will let uh, Joanna to take over the next question. I think that this last year and probably also this year has become kind of a year of reset where everything has to be reconsidered. Everything has changed. We're all moving to remote. We're all moving to slightly different ways of working, living, many of us as well. And I think this is a very decisive moment that gives us a unique opportunity and a chance to change so many things on so many different levels. Uh, which brings me maybe to one final question because uh, before I leave it out to Joanna to, to proceed, um, we are here today on the 8th of March. And of course, it's a very important day because we're celebrating the International Women's Day. And I would like to ask, ask a very, very different question kind of to uh, change the topic a little bit. Um, you know, when you look back at all your, at your wonderful things that you've done in your life and the career and the people you met. I'm wondering, maybe you could spot, kind of highlight some of the important encounters or some of the very most important, most powerful women that actually shaped the way how you think, how you design, how you build, how you invent, how you, you know, um, think about things. Um, I would love to hear some of those stories. Well, there's... <clears throat> There's no doubt that there are, I, I mean, first let me say that I, I grew up in an era where, where, where men and women were regarded differently. And, um, and I have, like all, you know, 20th century men, I, I have, I have <laughs> much to atone for <laughs> as a, as a man just disrespecting women. And, uh, and my wife, Sue Cooper has taught me a lot about shutting the hell up and listening to women, which is probably the number one thing that, that men need to do is to just shut up and listen to women. And um, I, <laughs> All right, so, I totally agree. You're absolutely right from from my perspective. So let me let me just give you a, a, a one. Uh, you asked for like a an anecdote of a woman. So let me say that Lane Halley, who was one of the one of the first uh, synthesizers at uh, at Cooper, um, one day just came to me and said, "Alan, you're." You're, you're off base about extreme programming and well, really about agile. I mean, I had, I thought extreme programming missed the mark and extreme programming morphed into agile. And, um, and I assumed that agile was extreme programming under another name. And she just kind of called me on it and she said, no, Shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You really need to learn about this. And she said, I'm going to take you out to meet some people. And she did. I said, okay, let's do it. And she took me out and she introduced me to some agilists. And I went, whoa, I'm, this is amazing. This is something truly unique and different in the world of, of programming, of software engineering. And, um, and it, and it completely changed my position on on that. And um, and I thank her to this day for doing that. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I think I think it's just really easy. To, it would have been easy for me to say, yeah, 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 <laughs> sure, and just shine her on. But but I think the lessons I learned from my wife to to listen uh, took root and. Um, so I there's there's been a huge, huge debate in America of that has resurfaced or expanded again recently, which is about Confederate monuments. The Confederacy was uh, they were a traitorous band of criminals who decided to destroy the United States of America in the in the 19th century. And, um, and, and we, we beat them militarily, but in many ways they, they won the war 
in the long term. And uh, and so there's been a, a resurgence of uh, of activism to remove Confederate uh, uh, monuments, symbols of the Confederacy. It's the way the the way the, the, the Germany realized after the Second World War that they they literally had to forbid uh, the symbology of Nazism. That that this is not suppression of free speech. This is the suppression of an enemy of free speech, and it was necessary. And the United States of America didn't do that. Instead, we we elevate and honor the Confederates, and it's a it's a sickness. It's a bad thing. And so there's a big fight over um, uh, Confederate flags flying over state houses in the United States. And in the middle of this, in the middle of this argument, this debate that took place in the press, there was a lot of discussion about whether these flags should come down or not. This wonderful woman, a brown skinned woman named Bree Newsom, went out and climbed up the flagpole and ripped down the Confederate flag and took it and ran away. I think she showed all of us, and certainly me, the power of what a woman can do, which is to say, let's take action. Let's do the right thing, despite the consequences. Yes, that's I think she's an American hero, Bree Newsom, and um, and she gives me she gives me hope. I I think that there are there are thousands of those stories. I mean, this is I don't study them. I guess. As I'm in my reading these days, I'm reading, like I said, I'm reading a lot about race and I'm reading a lot about economics and I'm reading a lot about history. And what I'm finding is that more and more, the books that I'm reading that seem to tell a more honest story and a more positive and um, inspiring story are written by women. By the way, you can go to my, uh, my Medium blog and every year I publish my bibliography of the books I read in the past year. And you can see, I mean, there's a lot of books about the military and just goofy books about woodworking and stuff. But you can also see the books that I read about about history and economics and and race. And um, and many of them are written by men, but but an increasing percentage are written by women. I think that women bring the voice. So I used to say this thing in at Cooper. I used to say, I really like working with women because this is not a story about individual women. This is a gross generalization. But I say that, that men live in that competitive world. So when you hear a, a, the crash of breaking glass, all the guys go, who did that? And all the women go, how can I help? Yeah, it's I a think, different perspective, I would say. Yeah. That's it, really powerful. Thank you so much, Alan, for sharing with us both the inspired, insightful story and also uh, this powerful uh, note on how our brains are probably somewhat differently wired and we bring different uh, qualities to the table. And so we complement maybe in some situations um, each other. I'm going to go on and ask another question. I also want to be mindful of the time and your time. We have 15 minutes left and I hope that after my question, Vitaly gets to ask another one or perhaps we can take a question from the audience. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask my question. I also had a question about personas, but myself and the audience were not sure whether you're tired of talking about personas. So I, I decided not to make it a question about personas. And it's a question that's very aligned to everything we discussed this evening. It's a question around ethical design. And um, I've noticed that throughout the design industry, the voice of uh, concerns around ethical design is growing and there are increasing conversations around this topic. But somehow I feel that on... Um, 
I think that it's still on a quite of an abstract level, if you want, and there there's not that much uh, actionable insight around how we can build more ethical and responsible products. So my question is, how can we be more ethical in our day-to-day work? Uh, some things may feel common sense, but I'm really curious to hear your thoughts around how we can build more responsible products. By vanquishing unconstrained capitalism. The answer is simple. It, this is the thing is, is, that, is, that, is that four years ago, five years ago, I started to, to see this ethical gap, this problem of ethics in our industry. And, and I, I, I created this idea of ancestry thinking, you know, to, to, you know, instead of making your slice of the pie bigger, make everybody's make the whole pie bigger, you know? And, um, and I began to realize that it's, it's, it doesn't matter how big of a pie you bake if somebody's burning down your house while you're in it baking. It doesn't matter. The pie doesn't matter. And I, all of a sudden I realized that ethics is not the issue. Ethics is, is, is our way of dealing with the fact that there's an elephant rampaging through the room. We need to look at the elephant that's in the room, which is that while we give a shit about ethics, our bosses do not because our bosses are trying to make lots of money. The CEOs way at the top are trying to make money and their values trickle down. So middle management is is stuck. They used to be ethical and they want to be ethical, but they also have to be a success in their job. And to be a success in your job, you have to be unethical. And the reason why you have to be unethical to be a success in your job is not because there's any fundamental need to be unethical. There is a need to be unethical because it is superimposed on every daily act by unconstrained capitalism, by fear. How can, but how can one designer working in his little, let's say, uh, box of, uh, of problems, how can, uh, how can we strive to understand which is the right thing? I can assume that obviously it's by talking to users and understanding what their needs are and not going against those needs. But more than that, should ethics be a, a mandatory part of any UX process? Should we consider ethics in a workshop before starting uh, to solve any problem uh, in a team. So I'm not sure how we can turn it into actionable, tactical uh, moves that we can implement every day in our work. Yeah, I don't think so. No, I, I don't think you can. I, I, I thought so. So here's the thing. So about, gosh, it's probably been about six years now. I had a conversation in New York City with a guy named Anil Dash, a very interesting character. And he said something that rocked my world because I was nibbling around the edges of this ethical question. And he said, ethics should be taught in every engineering college. And it just, he just harpooned me with that. I went home and I couldn't get it out of my head. And so fortuitously, a couple of years later, I met a young man named Renato Verdugo, who is an amazing guy. He works for YouTube. Um, And I I really liked Renato. And I really, we really had a simpatico. We worked well together. And I told him, I said, I had this challenge that Anil Dash had put in my head had Interestingly, I had been talking with some of the people at the University of California at Berkeley. At they have a design school there, and uh, and it's a multidisciplinary school with people from the architecture and business and software engineering departments coming there and taking classes. And it was very maker focused. It was all had all the right buzzwords and stuff. And I said they had been they had said to me, "Hey, if you want to teach a class here, you can do that." So I asked Renato if he would join me because, you see, I've never been to a university. <laughs> I'm a high school dropout and I really didn't know how to run a college class. And But Renato has a PhD. 
<laughs> and so I said, Renato, if you'll help me with some of the how to run a class, uh, we can do this together. And he said, yeah, let's do it. And so we we taught a class uh, called Thinking Like a Good Ancestor at UC Berkeley. And it was accredited. And it was a it was it was um, we ran it for two semesters. And it, it it was I should say thank you to Google because they uh, they subsidized Renato to do this. Uh, and the first semester was a big success. Some, some of our students were were just spectacular, and they said it was the best class they'd ever had. It was great. The second semester, Google started to pull support, and uh, and it was less successful because we found we were kind of rehashing old stories instead of cutting new ground, you know? Um, but a strange thing happened. There was a group of four uh, software engineer majors in the class. And they, <laughs> they were terrible. They were just terrible. And I was trying my best. I've been known to tell people that they're, they're terrible to their face and get into political trouble. You know, I, I have a history of doing that. And, and so I was really trying to bite my tongue. I was really trying to look for positive feedback for these guys who produced this terrible stuff. I mean, it was like the exact opposite of what we we're doing. They were, they were, they, they created a thing called, called good ancestry for dummies, which is so condescending and so wrong. And it was all about building good products that make a lot of money and build. I mean, they were just, these guys had so drunk the Kool-Aid of Silicon Valley venture funded capitalism. It was just an embarrassment. And Renato just let him have it right between the eyes. And I was, I was flabbergasted by this because Renato is, is a very politically savvy guy. These engineers lost their shit and one of them wrote a long email to Renato and me and the head of the of the uh the innovation department there and um and he threatened us he said I'm gonna get you fired if you do this shit this was a personal attack on me it had nothing to do with the quality of my work Wow, what a story. Yeah, it's uh... so we, we, Renato and I realized that this is not about ethics because these guys were basically saying, I'm, I've got the power to get you fired. I mean, I don't know if they did or not, but I wasn't about to test it. But by the way, this is the first time I've mentioned this publicly. Um, the, it became very clear to me that ancestry thinking was as good as it might be, still ignored the elephant in the room. And I kind of walked away from ancestry thinking at that point. I realized that, that this is not going to solve the problem. It's, it's like what the engineers are saying is that you can go off and play your ancestry thinking all you want. I'm still going to dominate the world because I have billions of dollars and you have your little ethics to play with. Okay. And it was, I couldn't have had a clearer demonstration of how, what you're asking for is you're asking for something that will make you feel good. And, The answer to that is I am really, really honestly sorry to say, no, that doesn't exist. I'm not going to give you a palliative because I don't think a palliative exists. And this is what I see in the industry today is I see interaction designers are, are grasping at palliatives. They're looking around for morphine while their gangrene is eating their body. It's You can't do that. It's not going to work. You could feel good as you die, but... If you want to live, you have to strike at the heart of the beast. There are no easy ways. And again, I say this with all due respect, sitting here on my ranch playing with my tools. <laughs> Holy shit. 
I want to put stop. my life on the line. But I want to uh, bring in Darren Hood into the conversation. He has an interesting uh, something to say to you. Uh, Darren, would you like to join in? Darren Hood. Come on, Darren. Or unmute yourself. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Hi, hi everybody. Okay. I know some of the people out there listening. Hello, Mr. Cooper. Uh, absolutely love you. Thank you. I just called myself a little Alan Cooper here a little ago because a lot of the stuff that you are talking about, I'm one of those people who's been fighting this battle. I said that UX was under siege in 2012 and have been fighting this battle now for almost 10 years, trying to right the ship uh, because UX has been first the UI people were trying to take it. And now the now the product designers are trying to take it. And a lot of skilled people can't even get hired because of the same mumble jumble that he was talking about. So absolute kudos to you, sir. And, and I will. I am fighting. I will continue to fight uh, just so you are aware. And I didn't really have a question for him. We were going back and forth and I was just trying to sort of calm some of the fire, put out some of the fires in the chat. Because it, one of the things I will say, since I've got the microphone, is we can't have a mindset that there's no hope. We can't have a mindset that education is broken. Uh, in addition to being a, uh, I, I designed my first website in 1995. Uh, I still, a matter of fact, somebody asked me for my top three books that I recommend that people read if they're in UX. And one of them is The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. If you are going to work in UX, well, what he said when I finally got into the, to the call is that one minute you are trying to, to develop the best user experience and you're looking out for your users and then you're trying to manage all of these, these hippos and all this other stuff that's going on and you have to have a strong EQ to be able to manage that so that you can, so that you can thrive in what you're doing. And so uh, we got we to fight that battle. We got to keep our head on straight. I'm, I'm, I'm on top of the 20 years, 20 plus years. I'm an educator. I'm a professor at Kent State University in the Masters of UX program. I'm a professor at Lawrence Tech University in Southfield, Michigan. I'm about to become a professor at, at Michigan State where I work during the day. I'm off today, but I work there full time in the LX. I'm a senior LX designer there. I just got an invitation to potentially become a professor at Syracuse University, all the while still fighting these UX battles. If we if if we will stand up, learn the history of UX, learn about people like Alan Cooper and other people that I refer to. I did a I had a course that I taught, and and Alan Cooper, your picture is in there too. This is one of those people who are at the foundation of this discipline. You can't just get into UX and not know who these people are. Nobody else does it. In any other discipline, they learn about the people who went before them. If we're going to thrive, we need to understand what he's saying. There should be 5,000 people on this call right now listening to what this guy has to say. Read about face. Read the things that, that he did so that we can wrap our minds around it. UX is not as confusing as people are selling it to be. It's conf if, if, if Like he said, people are after the money. If they get you to believe that you have no hope, of course, they're going to be the one that offer you the hope. If they get you to believe that that UX is confusing, they're the ones that are going to offer you some faux solution to try to address it being confusing. They're like, if anybody saw that terrible Spock movie, the Star Wars movie where Spock's brother was playing into people's pain to try to take advantage of them. That's what a lot of these clowns out here are doing. So I'm just as as straightforward as, as Mr. Cooper. I, again, I wasn't I didn't have a question to ask him. I was just talking to a bunch of people in the in the uh in the uh, chat today listen to my uh, uh listen to my podcast the world of ux with darren hood i talk about the same stuff you will hear a lot of the same things he's saying you will hear that on the podcast and that's not a plug for my podcast i'm just telling the thank truth. thank you darren thank you darren uh, thank you for joining us yep. yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. It's, um it's like the um the the propaganda across the world has been, oh, the destruction of the environment and climate change. Well, if you just recycle, they'll fix that. And what that does is that says, you individually are responsible for this stuff and you individually can fix it. And so what happens is, is I remember uh, on a holiday in Sweden three, four years ago, uh, as, a, as an American who, who recycles, <laughs> the, the, this, this, our Swedish uh, hosts said, oh, there's 14 different categories of recyclable commodities here. You have to separate all this. And, and it just freaked us out. 
it, it's what it is is it's saying you guys squabble among yourself about insignificant things and we'll continue to dump millions of gallons of effluent in the ocean you know it's it's we're not it's the 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 talking about the different categories of recycling is a very much in the interests of giant polluting corporations because what it does is is, is it takes our eye off of them and so this is this is what's this is the dynamic that's going on and and we are all very conscientious empathetic people because we are user experience designers and by definition you're not a user experience designer unless you're empathetic and conscientious and cooperative and collaborative and all that stuff and you want to do what's best for everybody and you work really hard on it and so they love giving you little exercises to do you know of finding whether the hamburger menu should be on the right or the left and it doesn't matter what matters is it the people who are not letting the hamburger menu solve the problems of humanity? That's where we need to go. As we, and you're right. Don't give up hope. Just because this is a bigger job than you thought it was, just because it's a nastier job than you thought it was, just because the odds of you surviving through this challenge are lower than you thought they were, doesn't mean that you can't do it. You Here's the opportunity to really do something for humanity. I mean, we've created, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, 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 it's like Oppenheimer creating the atomic bomb. Well, we created Facebook, which is worse, the atomic bomb or Facebook? <laughs> uh, that's it. Okay, uh, Alan, question. we have such a, we have a very short time constraint. I would ask you for, we have, we want to take two more questions from the audience, but keep it short, five minutes maximum per question. <laughs> and then we'll ask one last question from Vitaly. So, uh, Roman, you were the first, and then leave. Unmute yourself, please. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, greetings from Ukraine. Uh, looking to the past, uh, I first find out about the Alan Cooper and the essential of interaction design when I was learning how to design websites. Now, uh, 20 uh, years later, uh, I'm researching the origin of web design as a PhD student. Uh, I, I remember the time when the process uh, of uh, designing uh, web uh, was called uh, web mastery in 90s. Then uh, it divided into web development and web design. Uh, and then more common for design part of this process became UI UX uh, abbreviation. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, what is web design? Uh, was it just uh, um, uh, um, a junk word uh, for or or evolution? Uh, uh, of, of uh, UI UX, uh, how do you think? It's a good question, thank you. They're all junk words. UI, UX, IXD, web design, customer design, service design, it, they're all junk words. And, and, and God knows I've created my own junk words. Um, it's, uh, I, Part of, part of it is part of it is is correct. Is you start with junk words, and out of that, you know, emerges what matters and what's important. Uh, but but also a lot of energy is wasted in in internal fighting and in internecine battles. In 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 the UX community is fighting against the web design community is fighting against the the. You know, the interaction design community and and it's it's all you know it, it's it's a lot like fighting about how many categories of, of recycling do you have it's it's not the point and the fact that it occupies us conscientious collaborative cooperative empathetic people from not paying attention to what's really going on 
means that it's serving somebody's interests really well. And uh, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, the what you have to do is you have to say who benefit here. That's what matters. What matters is actions, not words. So, so the pandemic, like a year of the pandemic has enriched the billionaires by trillions of dollars while small businesses and individuals have suffered tremendously. You have to look at who benefits. You have to say, was the pandemic a terrible thing that happened to us? Or was it a, was it a terrible thing that was, that was sped along its way by people who benefited from the pandemic? You have to not listen to what people say. You have to look at what people you have to follow the money. And, um, and you have to say who's making money. Who's making money off design thinking and who's making money off goal-directed design and who's making money off web design. And, and you have to- Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. thank you, Roman. And now we'll move to Liv, another short answer. Liv. Well, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing everything that you've said because it really does resonate a lot. And so often it feels like uh, having shared a lot of these views, it's like you can kind of feel pretty isolated. Um, but hearing that come from you as, as someone who like, I've been reading your books and stuff for years. And so it's, it's fantastic. Anyway, the biggest thing that I've found about you is that you really do take unique stance on things, which is that like, I, I'm from a small town and so I connect to people rurally and I use that as a big key in my sort of UX tool set. And so for you in starting the ranch and interacting with people and talking with them, how do you get the most value out of talking to these, like sub, whether it's a subject matter expert or you know whether it's someone teaching you how to do some new farming technique or whatever, how do you really get to the core of that and make the most of whatever little time you have with them? Uh, yeah, you just said it. The amount of time that you spend with them, it's not enough. That's I couldn't you, agree more. <laughs> look, how? Let's say that you and I want to be friends. You know, yep. let's say that I want to be your friend and you're not sure. Okay, there's only one way to find out, and that's to spend time together. In the beginning, that time is highly structured, you know, because nobody wants to make a commitment. Right, so you're maximizing play. the ROI on that, and yeah. And time. How do you know if a piece of software is well behaved or not? We spend time with it. How many products have you seen advertised that look just wonderful and then you buy them and a couple of days later you realize they're shit or they mistreat you? It's because you spend time with them. The only way humans can learn about complex behavior is with time. You have to invest time. So as an interaction designer, you have to spend a lot of time with real users. And, the, and it doesn't end at the office either, of course. You know, like I, I, every time I talk to anyone anywhere, it's I'm drawing on that to, to build what I do at work. But I think that like in your case, for example, how do you make opportunities for you to have that time to spend with people? And I mean, I mean, I know obviously a lot of this comes down to personally how we live our lives, but say in a more corporate ex environment, getting access to real users is probably one of the hardest things we can do, despite that we have UX in the title. <laughs> um, so yeah. what are some of your tips well, on that, I guess? Well, but you notice the point is it is it why is that hard? I know. Who's yeah. Making... Where, where is that friction coming from? And, you know, <laughs> they value us enough to want to hire us. But then once we're in the position, it's kind of like, well, you know, we, we know that you really need to talk to people, but. <laughs> I. Um, like I've, yeah. I've met so many UX designers who've never spoken to a user of their product. They're and I UX. ask myself, how are you even in UX or how can you say that? So how you're, you're can we. Right. Yeah. If you, if you are a UX designer and you don't spend a lot of time listening, not talking to, listening to users, then you're not doing UX design. Sorry. Yeah, and I say thing, talking with, but yeah. Well, yeah, but you, you, the hardest thing 
for somebody like me to do is to shut up and listen. And <laughs> you, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to, to visit a user and, and to ask a question, say like, why do you like your job? And then shut up. And, 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 and the thing is, is if you ask somebody, what do you like about your job or what do you not like about it? They're not going to give you an honest answer because you're just some random stranger and you're probably going to make life miserable for them. So they'll give you some happy talk. So what you have to do is you have to invest time. You build a rapport. Like, again, it's like I say, in all those past experience living in a rural small town of like 2000 people, you, you realize that every interaction has to be genuine because there isn't a second chance with these people. And so it's the same way when we talk to our users is this is, you need to talk to them like a human being talking to another human being, not a researcher talking to another person. You still have those goals in the back of your mind and you're still recording all those things. But So when we moved out to the country, it was a, a real culture shock because hmm. I'm, you know, there's dairy ranchers all on all sides out here and it's their old school. They're, uh, they're, they believe that taxes are the most horrible thing in the world. And, and, and when you live out in the country, you're more like a, like a sovereign state than you are like a part of a, a community. And yet community is enormous to them. And what they did, what the neighbors did is they invited me and sometimes my wife, it's a very male culture. They invited me to their get togethers, you know, and they would have like a, a they would have a shootout. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they would be, they would set up targets and oh, yeah. spend the day banging away at stuff. And they'd put a rifle in my hand. I'm not afraid of guns, but I don't, I'm not a gun guy. They don't really interest me a lot. And they'd put a gun in my hand. And I'd take a couple of shots and then I hand it back to them. And they, they understood. They go, okay, he's not a gun guy, but he doesn't go, ooh, it's a gun. It kills people. And and they 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 made it clear to me when we first moved out here. They said, we believe that a man should be able to, and a man, they said a man. They, we believe that a man should be able to do what he wants to do with his own land. And what they meant was, don't you city guy come out here and tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. and they so, wanted you to integrate into their society, not the other way around not clear that I've integrated, but it's clear that I haven't objected. I don't come out here and impose my way on them. I don't, there's been some other- Having scenes. a low friction experience, yeah. And they, so on, on any given Sunday, there's a lot of gunshots going off around here. And whenever there's gunshots, the, one of my neighbors calls, calls me or my wife and says, do you hear all those gunshots? It's scaring the animals. You know, well, it's like, no, shut up. Just you're not helping. And she knows that. And that's why she doesn't call them. But she calls us because she knows we're like urban, you know. Uh, but but I don't like them banging away with their guns all the time. You should but, maybe convince them to get air rifles. They're a lot quieter and they still do the same thing. I'm not <laughs> well, I'm not no, I'm not I'm not trying to convince them to do or be anything. I mean, I really, really want to grab them. But if you had a really nice one, they might want to do it too. <laughs> See, it's kind of indirectly. Okay. Uh, we will stop on that note. Uh, uh, Vitaly, you have one more last question. Uh, thank I you, Liv, by questions. the way. Thank you for the interaction. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to say thank you to Darren and Liv and uh, Roman, I think, as well, for bringing out the questions. Very, very wonderful to hear your voices in here as well. Um, Mr. Cooper, I have one more question for you. Are you ready for this one? Yes. Oh, this is going to be a fun one because I like this question. Um, when you look back and also looking maybe forward and kind of what kind of UX salon events are expecting us in the future, I would like to hear from you if you think back, what are some of the biggest failures or the biggest mistakes or the biggest things where you learn the most? Because we always learn from making the mistakes, right? Uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've made and what did you learn from them? Oh, not even mistakes. Mistakes are yeah, easy. Uh, let's go big failures, the biggest failures you had. Well, the <laughs> the, the biggest failure, in a way, was also my biggest success. So I was a I was a product inventor. That's how I started in the 70s and in the 80s. 
And as a product inventor, as, as the 80s drew to a close, it became clear that, that um, that I needed money, I needed investment money to proceed building software. Um, and so I made the decision to become a consultant in 1990. And I think in many ways that was a mistake because as a consultant, you give up your power. As a product inventor, you have more power. On the other hand, if you take venture capital, you give up your power. And as a consultant, you, you, you see so much more of the world, but you see tiny glimpses of pieces of it. Whereas a product person, you see very deep into one narrow segment. Um, as the industry became dominated by money, as opposed to dominated by invention, um, I think being a consultant made me less powerful and less effective. And, and my work was less satisfying because more and more I was being invited into these boardrooms that had an elephant in the middle and nobody talked about it. Um, and I, I, as I look back, you know, I, I don't have any regrets about my career, but I think had I decided to stay in the product world and figured out a way to do it without investment capital, I think uh, it might have been more personally satisfying. But, you know, maybe that may be just a grass is always greener thing. On the other side, yeah. That's, so I, uh, that's, uh, please go ahead. Well, it was a, it was a, uh, I never set out to be a, a consultant, and I and and in fact, I thought I couldn't be a consultant. I was surprised when I said to some colleagues of mine, "I said, hey, I'll consult for you now." Uh, they turned around, and they said, "We'll hire you." <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, you will!" Uh, so, I, I don't, I don't know. I um, I tried in earnest four times to raise investment money to start a product company. And I failed to raise investment capital. Right. Uh, in many ways, I think that's the luckiest thing in my life. <laughs> yeah, frankly, I don't think that you're alone in this, if I'm being honest, because I know a lot of people who are actually happy that they never got invested, like investment, external investment, because they ended up actually keeping the company and growing the company um, and actually making kind of uh, making it into a life adventure on their own. So it's not like from you know, the idea is not like jumping from one product to another, but really just sitting on a product that you like and love. And this is, it has become your baby and then kind of growing it. So that kind of speaks from my heart as well. Every successful company, every successful large company has a horrible crime at its center. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would like to say thank you to all of the people who have joined and who are paying attention to this. And, and Avi and Vidli and Yana, thank you so much. I, you know, I've been out here in the ranch. I've been all by myself. And, and I'm, I've really, in, many, in the pandemic, I've just really lost touch with the world. And, uh, and I'm sitting here, I go, well, I don't have anything to say to anybody. <laughs> I think that we can go for more than another couple of hours, yeah, Alan. Maybe we should do it again. Uh, but thank you. I'm really honored to have you. Uh, Joanna, did you have a few last words? Uh, you're still here. I, yeah, of course, I'm still here. I was actually uh, captivated, too captivated to be able to walk away. Um, I just want to thank you for the invitation. I want to thank Alan for the, joining us tonight and for the valuable lessons and insights and all the all the value he put out uh, uh, here. And I'm actually grateful and it has been an honor. And I hope that I connect with many people from this conversation and we can take it 
um, online in other parts of the internet <laughs> from here on. So thank you all. And it has been an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I'm sorry. There's a lot of people wanted to talk, but it seems that we really ran out of time. So, uh, yes. Also, maybe just from my end, thank you so much for having me as well. Alan. Uh, Ioana, thank you so much for joining in. Um, and Avi, thank you as well for inviting me. Um, this is always a pleasure and it's always so inspiring to see and hear Mr. Cooper and his wisdom nuggets coming in. Um, I'm always listening when Alan is speaking. So pleasure to be here. Thank you for your excellent question. Thank you. Okay, so see you all in the next event, UX Fail, and it's uh, next month on the 5th, so April 5th. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye. everyone. Bye. bye.